Hey there, Commercial Construction Coffee Talk fans. Thanks for chiming in. My name's David Corson, and I'm your host. I'm also the publisher and editor of Commercial Construction Renovation Magazine. Oh, I got a little halo there, but this is what it used to look like. Just grabbed it. Uh, this is January 2021. Uh, Jason Sweeney, Facilities and Construction for uh, AAA of Southern California. This was an awesome looking issue. Thanks, Jason, for gracing the cover. And uh, let's see how big this one was. This one was uh, 140 pages. And uh, Let's see what I was doing. Oh, wow. This is this was a good one. Um, I was down at the Georgia. Uh, I played on the turf at the Georgia Swarm. They play uh, down in Duluth. Uh, this was right after they won the national championship. And this is me right here when I don't know, might have attend my first motorcycle, my Indian, took the governor off it. I was, we were playing Evil, Evil Knievel without helmets that day, <laughs> way back when, when uh, every, you know, when things weren't wrapped in bubble wrap. But anyway. <laughs> That was me way back down in memory lane, but I'll tell you, it's always nice to hold the magazine. We went digital 100% in uh, August of 2021 when I had White Castle as my, uh, they built their biggest uh, restaurant in uh, franchise or brand history. And uh, uh, then we uh, pretty much uh, gone 100% digital. Just last month, I had 4.8 million people uh, hit the site with interaction and hopefully I'll go over 5 million this month. I'll know here in about a week or so, and we just keep on climbing. So everybody out there on the wild, wild web that's, uh, signing into this or have set the website, you know, consuming content. Thank you so much. I couldn't have done it without you. And, uh, I really appreciate you, but TGIF to everybody. Uh, the weekend is here and, uh, I'll tell you, uh, I was up at the lot meeting the, uh, straw and Hey guy, uh, this morning. And it's going to be about 94 today, and the humidity's coming every uh, every day. It gets a little warmer, but it's been so nice. Uh, I run every day at night, and uh, it's just a uh, you know a little. It's hot. I sweat, but uh, the heat's coming. I just shedded my sh my long sleeve shirt because I was layering up for about five months to get ready for the heat in the summer. But it's almost time to put the shorts on and uh, just the shirt and uh, sweat my tail off. So uh, you know, it's just beautiful out here in uh in atlanta and uh we'll take it and uh looking forward to get out on the boat this weekend and uh you know having some fun so with that said i have one of my favorite uh peeps up in uh up in the great state of new york out in long island his name is joe scaretta <laughs> and he's uh the co-founder and ceo of cs hudson uh it's a it's a jack of all trades company you know they do facilities project management light renovation construction joe Say hello from uh, out in Long Island. Hey, what's happening? Good to be on the show, Dave. Good to see you. Yeah, absolutely. A pleasure having you. And uh, it, uh, you know, I say, I always say, I, listen, if you're on my podcast on Friday, I always save the best for last. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we've known each other a long time and you've helped me out with some people. I think the last time I, I said, hey, I need a, a union guy that can get a store done down at the, you know, at the New World Trade Center. And, uh, you know, he's like, oh, my God, you know, anyway, remember that? I do. Man, you don't forget anything. Damn. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, listen, you. that's where industry is. You know, you got to help people, you know, and I one of my one of my editorial board members needed a contractor to come in. He just had gotten the space done. It was like a pop up store. And Joe's kind of he does the pop up thing. So I was like, hey, you know, someone in there because I know you, you do jobs in there. And, and anyway, so we appreciated the help there. So you okay. know, everybody, it, it's collaboration, you know, communication, networking. So you, you never know when you might uh, some, you might get a call from me or, or from Joe and say, hey, let, let's do something. So, Joe, the way this is going to work. Uh, we're going to do it in three parts. You're going to tell your story, where you grew up, where you went to school, and then how you ended up at, at Sia Hudson. Then we're going to talk about the last three to four years on the roller coaster that we've all been on. Even though we're out of the tunnel, uh, you know, there's lessons there and any cool things there, are, you know, that you see out there in the uh, commercial construction uh, universe that's out there. And then you'll leave one positive thought or phrasing your contact info, and then we'll uh, and then we'll close it out. So with that said, the floor is yours. Tell us your story. Excellent. No, I, I appreciate that, Dave. You know, my story, <clears throat> it's probably similar to, to a lot of folks in our industry. I didn't grow up and say I wanted to be a retail commercial construction and facilities management company, right? I think I grew up as a youngster. I loved the entrepreneurial edge, right? I always loved uh, focusing on different businesses, different business ideas. Um, so when I, I grew up, I grew up on Long Island. I went to Connecticut High School. Um, I, unlike maybe everyone else in school, you know, I also did the work in school thing. So I started out in retail, right? I grew up in retail, uh, started out Old Navy Gap, 
then moved to Sports Authority, um, but became the youngest uh, store manager at Keys and Co to a $10 million store for Sports Authority. Uh, but then like everybody else, you, you, hit that, you hit that ceiling at some point, right? And they told me, uh, the district manager told me I, I couldn't get promoted any, anymore because it was the next place was his job. And so for me, it was like, what's next? And to your point, you touched on networking, Dave. I networked with so many people when I was in the retail space too. And I became friendly with this uh, courier service that we worked on for delivering systems. And he had suggested I, I reach out to a small retail construction company. He says, you like customer service, you know the retail space really well, go, go talk to them. And so I started working with this small retail construction company. Didn't know much about construction at the time, uh, but I knew interacting with contractors and what that was like in the retail environment. And so worked there uh, for probably about eight months or so, met my partner now, Moses. Uh, we met there, we grew a number of accounts. And then like anything else, I think we learned the business, but we felt that there was, we could do better. And we felt that we could do it better on our own. So we were doing every job in the place uh, because it was a small shop and decided to start off and go out on our own. And in 2003, we started our first company. We grew to about almost 50 million in revenue. Um, doing the same thing, right? Repairing maintenance and then capital renovations and, and construction projects. What we found was, and I think one of the things I'll touch on later is, you know, always focusing on the gaps in the industry, right? There was this gap that we found in our industry when we first started was these small CapEx projects. Larger GCs didn't want them. They couldn't be cost effective. Smaller single trade companies couldn't handle them, right? When it gets to multi-scope, multi-trade. And my partner and I did a great job. We focused on VE process, reducing the scope timeline. And we found that we started out with clients on the maintenance side and quickly grew into this project side of our business uh, and grew pretty steadily through the years. We got to the point, we grew it. We felt that you know we had no debt on the business. We wanted to um, take the company to the next level. And we said, how do we do that? We decided to partner with private equity. We recapitalized in 2012, stayed for a period of about five years. And it was every story you hear about private equity, I would say we we're probably up in that 98 percentile, right? It was uh, it was not the best experience. We stayed for a period of five years, but we learned so much through that process, um, and we stayed, right? Even in really bad, untenable environment. Uh, but then we moved on. We started CS Hudson. Uh, we focused on a, a lot of different end markets than we didn't focus on when we were at uh, our prior firm. And here we focused on going after markets that were really essential, right? where in our prior life, we were more retail driven. And here we have a retail footprint, but we also go after end markets that are essential services, which during that period over the last three or four years was very beneficial to us. And a lot of companies have now grown into those end markets and spaces like gas convenience, uh, telecom, warehouse storage, logistics. Um, a lot of those areas, you'll see a lot of the companies and competitors in our industry are really focusing on those markets now, because during any type of shutdown in the future, they're not going to shut down. They're going to continue operating. And so it's been really a great, great experience. Um, last year, we partnered with a firm called Orion Services. Um, they're the largest, I would say the largest owner of facilities management companies in our industry that I had never heard of. Um, they're heavily focused on investing in people, process, programming, um, really building solutions for their clients. And uh, it's been an exciting partnership uh, since we joined them. Hey, there's... Uh... There's nothing like entrepreneurship and uh, you, you need money to do stuff, but then, you know, there's always, there's always ties to it. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like the government. Hey, yeah, here, you can add this. There's always a tie to it. You know, there's always that string there. And, uh, you know, it, um, but you're, you're a survivor, you know, you, uh, you know, you're still standing. And uh, you got that background. And uh, I did my retail experience. I did my retail. Uh, my, my parents were in upholstery manufacturing my dad's side, my mom, our construction, I, they've been in uh, demolition recycling since 1888 outside of Philadelphia. So okay. uh, I come from a construction family, but when I did my retail experience, when I was out at the University of Denver, uh, after I graduated and I didn't make the pros on the, on the frozen pond, um, I, worked at Le I worked at Levitt's Furniture. And uh, we, yeah, anyway, I did everything. I scotch guarded, I was a picker, I worked in merchandising, I learned everything. And then when it came time for me to uh, go down to, to our plant in Hickory, North Carolina, where there was one hotel and one restaurant in the mid 80s during the recession when interest rates were 18 percent. You know, uh, 
I just said, you know, I don't know if furniture is my bag, you know, and uh, but I put more of those little brass tables together. You know, they were like the little drink tables. They were lost <laughs> leaders that we used to put in the back of the at the store. And uh, I ran the scratch and Dan, I, I, I unloaded truck. I did everything. And uh, it was a great experience. Uh, but um, all of the, all of those things I did, though. You know, between on my, my mother's side and the construction, I grew up down at the scrapyard. When I turned 16, all the grandsons had to work in the uh, scrapyard. I shoveled asbestos. I laid railroad tracks. I welded. I did all that. And everything that I did when I and, and believe me, I was like the worst English, you know, English was not my gig. I was good with numbers. So my English teacher from prep school, he laughs at me when he sees I call myself a publisher or editor. He's like, of course, and you couldn't even do a five paragraph essay <laughs> in uh, school. They laugh at me right now. But he's like, I can't believe you. That, you know, I'm like, hey, listen, I still give it to my editor. He still redlines it, you know, but uh, all the things that you did, you know, through that, it molds you because you pick up little things and you put them in your knowledge vault. And then as you, you know, go along your career, you can use those things to, you know, build your empire. So it, uh, it all, it, history always repeats itself. It just does. And uh, so what a really, really good story. Kids, right? You got kids? Yeah, so I have two. I have a little guy who's nine uh, and I have a daughter who's 15, both heavy into travel soccer. Um, both, you know, are little superstars, right? They're, they're incredible. And uh, my daughter, not so little anymore, which is kind of crazy. Uh, in high school. And uh, so we, we do a lot of travel soccer with them. She's focusing on trying to go D1 for a soccer uh, scholarship. So there's a lot of conversations there and all the prep work that's required. And then my wife is a CTICU nurse. So she actually went back to school, um, you know, three, three years ago and became a nurse just because she decided she wanted to be a nurse, which is incredible because she loves the health and sciences world. And to be able to go from being a stay-at-home mom right back into the field, into a, a premier hospital, uh, delivering those types of services is, is incredible. I'm in awe by it, honestly. No, I, hey, listen, uh, anybody that goes into, you know, medicine, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, nurse, you know, paramedic. I mean, it's a, uh, it's an awesome thing to do. You're on the front line and uh, you're an essential person. And, uh, you know, everybody's going to, you know, those people hats off to you, you know, it's just, you know, look, I was talking to a guy yesterday. I had a podcast, this guy out of County he was in the heavy equipment market and uh, he uh, was bringing up the essential part. And I said, look, when, when uh, you know, when the roller coaster started in March of 2020 for all of us, you know, construction, we had to put the mask on. So we were all essential. People just got on the planes and you did it. And, you know, you had to keep on going, depending on what state you were in, obviously with regulations and stuff, but pretty much everybody else had, you know, just kind of just went with it. And, uh, you know, we're all still standing today. And, um, uh, and if you're anybody out there and you were one of those people, kudos to you for, uh, you know, being a trooper and, and doing all that stuff because no one knew what the heck was going on. So, except, you know, you had to get the project done because, you know, you, you, the, the circulars were done and in retail, everything is backed up for the, you know, with the schedule of getting the store done, because that's when the, the store is going to open, as you well know, being in retail. So, um, so let's talk about that, you know, March 2020 and uh, everything goes kaput and, oh, it's going to be a couple of weeks. Here we are four years later. We're still kind of, you know, we're out potholes, uh, little hindrances, speed bumps. Uh, we're going through a labor shortage product. You know, it, it's all kind of settling in. Talk about how any lessons learned as you weathered the storm into today. It's interesting enough when you're, when you're humming along and you're growing and you have the revenue um, and things are happening, there's, there's parts of your business where I think there's opportunity to streamline and drive efficiency. And honestly, I think during that period of time, it, it forced us to look at areas of our business that historically we never did, right? Really managing down to the dollar to that level and that extent um, where, again, as you grow and you start to grow your revenue, there's certain areas where you can recapture some of that bottom line EBITDA, right? Uh, becoming more efficient in the organization. Um, and then also out of necessity, trying to find ways to communicate with the clients and deliver services. Um, was also really invaluable, right? It forced us to value engineer a lot of our own internal processes to for survival. And I, I think that was a that was a key for us. It was a key unlock for us because the following year we saw all the efficiencies that we gained during that period of time um, really drive the business forward even further than we at a faster pace than we were at prior. And so 
while it be a painful lesson and a painful uh, you know time frame, uh, we took some positives out of it. Honestly, being able to really right size our organization and find opportunities to to really drive process enhancements at that time. There are so many guests that I've had, whether it's on here or just on the phone that I talked to over the last couple of years, that they they said that they had some of the best years that they've had. They learned more about their company. They learned more about their people, uh, especially if they were working in the office and they had to get them to work out of the out of the home. Uh, they they proved themselves. They trusted them. Uh, their company culture was still maintained and they could have done more business if there were more PMs or more superintendents uh, and they would have just had that, mon- that many more projects and more profitable. But the biggest thing was that they learned more about what they thought they knew and also improved some of their, you know, internal parameters. You know, every company's run differently, but the way that, and it was just, it was a learning experience. I mean, look at me, I was print face to face. I had my, uh, let's see, and. January of 2020, I had my 10th anniversary summit, had the most people I ever had there. I did my first cocktail party in Coconut Grove down in uh, Florida. And uh, I was in Milwaukee uh, looking at hotels for my retreat when, uh, you know, Tom Hanks got it and a March Madness got canceled. And actually, I was going to uh, that weekend, I was going to Columbus to watch uh, uh, the University of Denver play uh, the Buckeyes in in the horseshoe on lacrosse. And uh, that got canceled. I was going to meet my parents up there. We're going to go to the game. And anyway, uh, it, uh, you know, it it was a crazy, crazy time. However, when you, when you look back that, you know, you really had to, you know, listen, when I went digital, you know, I put my issue out and then I was fighting with my printer and I was like, look, half my circulation is furloughed right now. I don't even know if their offices are open. I'm going to spend all this money on paper and ink. I Let me do it. You know, you know, it's economy stale. You've been a publisher forever, blah, blah, blah. So I bit the bullet and I, I put that March, April issue out because I, I had my event. I told my, my exhibitors, my sponsors, hey, we're going to do the wrap up coverage here. But I'll tell you, in the month of April, there were nights where I got up and my, and my wife said, where are you going? I'm like, it's, it's three in the morning. I'm like, I got to think. And but my editor, and my art, artists were like, "Hey, let's go digital. We have so much content, and which you know, we had a digital magazine forever. Thank God I had it, and um, uh, we just kind of rolled the dice. But now, when I look back today, I'm a content creator, uh, you know, on the web, and I was a print face to face guy three to four years ago, and you know, I Maybe. made a transition. I don't miss the post office. I don't miss the printer. <laughs> I don't miss any of that stuff. I never had." a million people hitting my digital magazine. But when that happened, everybody was home, everybody was on the web. And then it just kind of, you know, it just kind of climbed. Yeah, it was bizarre, you know, but now uh, I kind of look at it and, uh, you know, last year I took, a, I took the year off. I, you know, I, I still had the magazine I was running, but I went back, I took a year and a half of digital classes. I got Google and Microsoft certified and learned how to do TikTok, YouTube, uh, all this stuff. And, uh, and now I just launched my digital agency and I'm helping people with their SEO and all this other stuff. And I'm sure you get emails every day. Hey, I can get you ranked and whatever, you know, listen, I lived it. I, I put it on my website. I, I know, you know, I don't want to be a clipper, but I know a lot of people that, that I could help scale their businesses because I went through it myself. And um, it, uh, it's been amazing, you know, as I look back to where I was, to where I am today, uh, I always try to make a positive out of a negative. And that's what I look at over the last, you know, three or, you know, during this roller coaster, you know, yeah, it was a bummer. And listen, if you were smart, you know, let's say you're a, you're a hotel firm, you know, your hotel was, uh, you know, wasn't operating because it had to be, you know, closed during that time, you should have put new carpet in, you should have painted the walls, you should have put new ff e so you didn't have to do it floor by floor. So when the country did reopen, you were ready, you know, to take back your customers. And that happened with, with any, any brand, you know, retail, restaurant, hospitality, whatever. Federal, if you were doing highway projects, you were probably still going, you you were going strong, but the people that were, that kind of stood still and whatever, I don't, you know, they, they probably didn't have as good of an experience, but the ones that, that, and I'm, I use the word pivot way too many times. It's a, it's an athletic term. I, but the bottom line is the people who turned on a dime and just, put the blinders on and went for it. Those people had amazing 
uh, you know, experiences and scaling their business, improving it. And now as they've come out to it, they've got their infrastructure in place and whatever happens down the road, they're probably prepared for it, you know, because, uh, you know, it, it was, you know, listen, it was, it, it was rough on everybody. You know, it just was, I was working out of my house. So I was, I was remote anyway, but, uh, you know, some people are, they can't work. They have to go into an office because they're not built to work out of the house. Other people can. And I think that was probably one of the toughest things that uh, people had to, you know, Hey, you got your kids home. You, you know, everybody's at home. You're trying to, you know where I'm coming from, right? Yeah, of course. You're trying to juggle everything at home. I, I think for us, we were one of the first companies back once they allowed companies back, especially, um, because we're delivering critical facility services, um, we got back in the office really quick. I want to say it was after, right after July 4th, we were back in the building. And, yeah. you know, we're delivering, you know, support services for dark stores, you know, so making sure that they're safe, they're not getting vandalized. We did, we do a tremendous amount of board ups, right? And you talk about pivoting, we were doing uh, sanitation stations on the reopen. We were doing wayfinding signage for sanitation stations. And we also even did pop-up vaccination stations. So we were building pop-ups and then they were putting vac stations in them. So just leveraging our existing infrastructure and footprint and vendor network to then deliver services that were critical to our environment at that time. And I think that really also helped us as part as an organization. Yeah, you know, the saying, hey, hey, when it gets tough, the tough get going, It's it was ever so true over the last couple of years. And, uh, and uh, you know, being being an athlete, you know it, it. You know winning and losing. You got thick skin, but when you get out in the business world after your sport, your athletic career is over, you, you've got thick enough skin to to deal with it because it's it's very competitive out there. You know, uh, I can deal with bumps and bruises, but you know when you, oh the, your the, the twenty projects we're going to do, we're going to put those on hold, or we're going to we're not going to pay you in our thirty day. It's going to be one hundred and sixty days or whatever it was. Uh, no one wanted to pick up the phone because uh, they you didn't want to get bad news, and you know having a cell phone was golden. You know, if you had that and uh, if they picked it up, that was another that was another uh, whole nother story. But it uh, it really was, uh, you know, a crazy time, uh, a rough time for a lot of people. But as I look back, uh, I definitely became a much better business person uh, and learned so much more about my company that I thought I knew that I didn't. And I thought I knew a lot of digital stuff, too. And I didn't. And uh, now uh, it uh, it's uh, it it's been it, it was amazing ride. You know, every day was different. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. But, you know, the bottom line is you, if you can get home at the end of the night and look yourself in the mirror and know that you left everything out on the field and then get That's up it. the next day, hey, rock and roll. You're, you're, you're still standing. So what do you see, you know, as far as anything that's, uh, that our listeners out there might find of interest that you see, you know, might be coming in the pipeline that, you know, you know, parameters of the way things are done? You know, interesting enough, you know, one of the things that we, we, we've spent a lot of time talking about are non-competes. You know, we're seeing there's a lot of activity now about getting rid of or moving away from non-competes. And honestly, I would say we were an early adapter for that, right? Heavy supporter of it. I um, think it's really a tactic to try to hold people back from, from elevating outside an organization uh, if the opportunity doesn't exist within the company. And I think from a client standpoint, I think our feeling has always been that if we're doing a great job over servicing the client, they shouldn't feel a difference if somebody leaves the organization, right? Um, but also it shouldn't be held as a tactic to hold someone back if they don't want to be there, right? You should have, there should be no non-competes and people should want to stay because they're happy within the organization. And if you have to have non-competes, the question is why, right? And so I think we're excited to see the progression of the complete abolishment of non-competes, right? Um, because in the future, I think having the ability to move to an organization that offers you upward mobility uh, versus forcing someone to stay somewhere where they're unhappy and there's no ability for them to move. Uh, to me, it's, it's almost a bully tactic, honestly. Yeah. No, you know, listen, in, in retail, uh, I always see when people have their anniversaries on LinkedIn and you'll see a guy that's been there for 35, 40 years, and then you'll see you know, the complete opposite where that another individual has been at like 10 different brands, but they were smart enough to see when the writing was on the wall that it's time for me to leave and so forth, where the other person, he probably, you know, went through the pit pitfalls and valleys and, and, uh, you know, is still there. And, uh, um, you know, if you're not happy in what you're doing, you, you go, go do something else. You only have one life, right? 
yeah, get out, go somewhere else and focus on something that makes you happy, right? I think not, not to quote, there's one of the large, uh, you know, digital multi-site uh, manufacturing and distribution center companies out there that's basically paying employees after a certain point if they want to leave, they're willing to pay them to leave, right? And to me, that's, that says a lot, right? You're willing to pay someone to leave the organization if they're not happy, right? Someone here or someone in your organization is happy, they're gonna work hard for you every day and for the organization, the people, the customers, the vendors, the camaraderie, the teamwork, the partnership, the culture. If someone doesn't fit well or doesn't wanna be there, maybe it's worth paying them to leave. Yeah, no, hey, uh, I'll tell you, when I took my digital classes over the last 18 months, the biggest thing that I learned was a uh, positive mindset. You, you can't have negativity. Negativity, it's not good in the athletic, you know, in the locker room. It's not good out in the field. It's not good within your business. It's like cancer, you know, and it spreads. And those individuals, and I just said, told my, you know, my wife, she's like, oh my God, you've mellowed out and whatever. And I said, look, I don't have time for people. People don't want to play in my sandbox. There's plenty of other sandboxes and there's plenty of other people that I can invite in. Not everybody's going to like me. I, you know, that's okay with me. You know, I, it, it's life. But, uh, you know, it was interesting. My, my son, he, uh, he went to um, aviation mechanic school, got his A&P license, worked for Boeing for three years, had a great career, worked in the plant for a, a year. And then uh, there was a job that opened up to be a flight ops. And he was out there working on the 787s, $350 million airplanes. I thought he was going to stay there forever, but he was just getting bored because he was working on the same plane, but he really went to be a maintenance guy. He wanted to work on, uh, you know, engines and all that. He, you know, he could be in the cockpit. He could be in the wheel well. He could be yeah. uh, empty in the freaking bathroom, you know. Uh, but uh, he uh, started uh, a couple of weeks. He moved back home. Uh, even though we're empty nesters, he came back to Atlanta. And uh, he, yeah, he'll probably get his own place within the year. But anyway, he went to work for a, a small regional jet place uh, called Epps. And at the small airport uh, just above downtown called PDK and uh, really beautiful jets come in there. Anyway, uh, this this uh, service, uh, they work on Pilatus and uh, they've got uh, uh, their jet frame, I think, is six years old and they have turboprops. Uh, but they're beautiful planes. And there's about six or seven technicians, but all those guys have been there like 10, 15 years and they've been there forever. They treat their their, their people like gold. And. His first day back, he goes, oh, my God, what a difference of just the way that they operate. I mean, I had to sign off, you know, listen, Boeing's, a, you know, it's a government contractor. And, you know, you got all the rules around. Everything's got to be signed off on. But, you know, here they're doing the same thing, but it's just a completely different atmosphere. And he's so much more happier, you know, and uh, it's it, it's amazing, you know. And uh, he had a killer shift in Charleston. He was uh, 230 to 11. He was only 23. Well, when he went there, he was 22 and um, uh, he could still go out at night. I think the ratio in Charleston with, with girls to guys was five to one. So he was having a field day. And uh, uh, but, you know, he made he, he made the transition. I said, whenever you move, if it's lateral, that's OK. But you always want to be moving up. Don't take don't take the you know. And um, so he, he came back and we went down to Dallas to look at another one. Uh, he, he, I said, put your resume out. So he had five job offers because he's, he's in demand. And um, anyway, we went down to Dallas. We, it was a place called uh, Flex Jets. Be beautiful. Oh, Flex Jets. Yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we, we sat on an $80 million citation that he was going to be uh, working on. Anyway, they had all sorts of jets that they had in their fleets. Anyway, uh, young, young, young guys out there and they gave him a raise. He was going to be four days on, four days off and this and that. Uh, I had family down there. We found a room for him. We we drove around Dallas and Fort Worth and showing them. And I was like, "Look, every Fortune 500 company has an office down here. It's a huge. You got the beach. You got the you got the the planes. You got you know, it, it, it's a cool place, Texas." And uh, yeah, so but he, he a bunch of his buds are Delta pilots here in Atlanta, and he said, "You know, I just want to come home." And, uh, you know, uh, I want to, if I don't like it, I can always, I'm young enough that I can go do something else, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and, Bo and, and Boeing was great. Listen, if you're a Boeing guy out there, listen, you told my son, you treated him like gold and he learned so much. So we really appreciated the time, but you know, when it, you know, you get bored, you got to go do something else, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, so here he's really getting to what he went to school for and, and he's taking his license. He's got his pilot license. Now he's going for his commercial. And 
uh, ultimately, uh, you know, aviation, uh, you know, that was his calling, but it's night and day, you know, when I look back, when I had to drag him out of the, out of his bed every morning and make him go to school to yeah. now he gets up, he, you know, he's out of the house before six, he's got to be there at seven. He's on seven to three thirty shift here. And, um, uh, he comes and comes home. He's in a good mood. He, he's just more, you know, calm. And uh, so, you know, those types and, and you should have that in any size business, whether it's big or small, your people should be happy. They should want to come to, you know, work, get things done, have fun. And uh, you, you know where I'm coming from? Of course <clears throat> I do. And I think part of what's important to us here is, is the culture, right? Culture is what keeps the organization alive. Right. It's the it's the organization's heartbeat and culture should want to make you stay at a place as long as you possibly can. Right. And for the folks that don't fit in within the culture, sometimes it's a quick opportunity for it to be in and out. Right. There's people that for whatever reason, the culture is able to move people in and out that maybe don't fit within the organization. And so culture is a big deal. And if you're happy in an organization, you're going to work hard. You're going to care about the organization. You're going to have fun. And if you're having fun, it's not it's not work anymore. Yeah. The biggest thing I heard from him was he goes, you know, it's really not about the money. I just wanted to have fun. And, uh, you know, uh, I make good money there. I make good money here. But, you know, it, it's it's just a different atmosphere and the way things are done. And um, I'm so glad that I made the move because he was he was having those, you know, little voices in his head going, don't leave, don't leave, you know, and they and of course they tried to keep him, you know, uh, yeah. but they did say, look, if you ever want to come back, we would welcome you back with, you know, open arms, you know, and uh so, it, you know, you never want to burn your bridge either, you know, whenever you leave. I think the litmus test is, are you jumping out of bed to get to work? Are you excited? If you're dragging yourself out of bed, then, then you know, then you know it's not the right time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you're, if you're out there, commercial construction coffee talk land, and uh, you, you know, you'd want to bump some, uh, you know, questions off of uh, Joe or, you know, talk about non-competes or, or whatever might be a burning desire that he might have some knowledge on. Joe, how would someone reach out to you to, uh, you know, just talk? Absolutely. You can reach out to me via email, uh, Jay Scaretta. So my first initial, my last name at cs-hudson.com or feel free to give me a call, uh, mobile 631-431-7585. Feel free to reach out. There you go. So if, if you, ha you know, if you've never done a pop-up before, or, uh, you know, you want, if you've never done any data centers or, you know, whatever it might be, what we've talked about, give Joe a call. He's, uh, he, you know, he's, he, he's in that retail thing, but he's going in all these other areas. And, uh, like I said, I've known him a while and, uh, he does good work. You know, like I said, I, I, I reached out to you when I needed that help at that wall street, uh, jobs, you know? So I was like, uh, Scred is going to be able to do this. I think he does work down there. So, you know, it's just a networking thing. So, uh, uh, but give him a call. Listen, if anybody wants, wants to reach me, you can get me at David C at CCR dash mag.com. And, uh, listen, Joe got on here. His publicist reached out to me and I was like, yeah, let's have him on here, man. I've known him forever. And uh, so uh, don't judge a book by cover. Send me something. And listen, very tough to get in the magazine, but we post all day long. We've got so, so many different platforms that we put content out on. You can send us a, an anniversary for your, your company, a new hire, uh, maybe came out with a new product announcement. Uh, you name it, we look at it. And if we put it out there, our TAT, our turnaround time is probably 24, 48 hours. We send you the link so you can share it. It's a win-win. It's good for your SEO, which is search engine optimization. That's how Google finds you. And um, uh, like I said, we look at everything. If it comes to, and I answer all my own emails. So they, you know, I, I get to them and uh, you know, we look at everything. It's like playing the lottery. If you don't, if you don't buy a ticket, you can't win. If you don't send me anything, I can't post it. I can't get you in the magazine. I can't do this thing kind. And you never know where things might come. Uh, but once again, his published friend and I said, Hey, we should be on the podcast and, you know, find a time. And here we are, you know, that's how these things work. So as we finish up, Joe, uh, it is TGIF today. It's the weekend. Uh, next, next week ends, uh, basically Q2. Uh, I always do a six month data, you know, year, uh, you know, 180 day plus assessment. I'm looking at my pace because I jot down my time every day. If I'm, even if I'm only cut, you know, cutting down a couple of seconds on my pace, I'm happy with that because it, it, it's the sum is always be bigger than the whole. So 
as we go into 4th of July and the second half, you know, Q2, Q3, Q4, and finish out 2024, what positive thought would you leave with our listeners out there? I think positive thought for me would be <clears throat> focus on finding the opportunities, look for the gaps in the, in the industry, and just keep pushing forward, right? I think, you know, Q3 and Q4 are going to be explosive quarters uh, from a build standpoint and a renovation standpoint. And get in there, find your niche, find your program, build it from the ground up. Let's go. That's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, uh, yeah, once again, you know, my thing is, listen, you're going to have things that happen. Always try to make a positive out of a negative. Number one, you're going to, uh, it'll, it's, you're going to make mistakes. All right. If you're not making mistakes, you're not working hard enough, in my opinion. Number two, you can learn from that mistake. You can put it back in your knowledge vault and you can use it on another day when that pop, when that hindrance pops up in front of you again, you're going to be like, oh, this is how I need to handle that. And uh, the day you stop learning is the day you should go do something else. And I make mistakes every day. I learn every day, you know? And uh, so, and I learn from all these conversations I do here and hopefully you do out there as well. So that's an awesome, awesome quote. A couple things before we finish up. Number one, if you are out on a construction site, we want you to be safe, okay? Go home, be able to have dinner with your, you know, your spouse, your husband, your wife, whatever, your kids, your pets, if you have a turtle, whatever. We want you to be safe. Get some REM sleep, get up and, you know, with a smile on your face and go do it all again the next day. Number two, summer's here. Humidity, heat. Okay, the athlete me is going to tell you, stay hydrated, liquefied. Make sure you drink as much liquid as you can. If you get dehydrated, you get headaches. When you get headaches, you make mistakes. That's how you get hurt on the athletic field. Same thing on the construction site. So make sure that you're, you know, especially when it's really, really hot. I know a lot of firms are coming in where they, they're mandatory times to stop, to, to, to get liquefied. But make sure you drink lots of, you know, water, liquid. Make sure you put the electrolytes in your bottle. You'll sleep better. You'll feel better. Trust me on this because I sweat my tail off every day down here. I'm doing my trek. And lastly, hit the like button. We want to get the algorithms to go find Mr. Scaretta's story out here. You know, he's got a great one. And uh, so hit that. And we want you to come back and uh, hear some more episodes down the road. So, Joe, any last thoughts before we sign off? Just I, I think the most important part is you got to focus on, you know, hard work's going to take you places. Talent can't keep you. And so you got to push forward and keep working hard. Yep. You know, uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. You know, it was, it. it was on my prep school gym, man. And we used to, we were a little prep school playing all the big high schools in New Jersey. And everybody's like, oh, the preppies are going to come in here. We're going to kick their tail. And we walk out with a W, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's like a David and Goliath thing, you know? So, uh, well, everybody, it's TGIF. Everybody have a great rest of the afternoon and, uh, you know, enjoy your weekend, relax. Like I said, clear your mind, have fun and uh, get ready to do it all, all again next week. And then you got 4th of July and, uh, you know, celebrate uh, Independence Day. So, Joe, say goodbye from uh, out Long Island. Thanks for having me. Good seeing everybody. And uh, thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to sign off from Sugar Hill, just below the Buford Dam, all about 25 miles north of downtown ATL and uh, Lake Lanier up here. And uh, as always, we appreciate you all. And we will see you next time on another episode of Commercial Construction Coffee Talk. Joe, I look forward to seeing you when I get up to uh, the Big Apple and out in the island, all right? Because, you know, I'm going to come up there eventually, all right? Looking forward to it, Dave. All right. Ciao, everybody. See you. You bet.